Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, we're going to find that there is a, a reason behind the shipwreck, and that is that uh, they would make a stop that they weren't planning on, on making, so that the uh, gospel would be brought to the inhabitants of this island called Malta. Acts chapter 28, uh, our text this morning is verses 1 through 10. Please listen carefully as I read it. This is God's word. And when they had been brought safely through, then we found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall dead or fall, fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it came about that the father of Publius was laying in bed, afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him, and after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. And after this had happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. And they also honored us with many marks of respect. And when we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. So in the reading of God's word, may he bless this part of his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, needless to say, we are coming very close to the close of the book of Acts, which, as we've seen, is the story of Christianity's early spread throughout the world. Jesus, in his Olivet Discourse, which we find in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, said, The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, if, if you remember what, um, at least my particular view of this, um, uh, the Olivet Discourse is and of the uh, end of the world, what he was referring to here, I believe what he was most likely referring to was the end of the then present state of the kingdom of God. Remember that the uh, book of Acts is really a chronicle of how the gospel is being spread throughout the whole world or the whole Roman Empire. And it's taking place during a time frame between AD, uh, well, between the end of Christ's ministry in AD 30 and AD 70, when there is the end of the old covenant economy, how the Lord allowed it to exist and how he allowed the new covenant and the old covenant to overlap for those 40 years so that he might give the Jews a space of time to repent and to embrace their Messiah so that the Roman Empire might be evangelized and all the Jews reached first and then the Gentiles, if the Jews should reject. Because, again, at the end of this time frame, when the gospel had been offered to all the Jews, then the kingdom of heaven was to be taken away from them and given to a nation that would produce its fruits. Now, we know that this end did come in AD 70. God sent his armies, in, that is, the Roman armies, to destroy the temple and to tear down the buildings. And he did put an end once and for all to the Jewish economy. And this was a final end to God's plan for the Old Covenant arrangement. His son had fulfilled it. And so it was time for it to vanish away. But of course it was also his judgment upon the Jews for killing his son. So we see the Jews would no longer be central in God's plan, but now really they would be on the outside only to be gathered into the kingdom through evangelism. They were the ones that were given this opportunity to receive the Messiah first because the Messiah was promised to them. But of course, with greater privilege comes greater responsibility. And since they rejected their Messiah, God's judgment would be terrible. The book of Acts, again, is meant to be a chronicle of reaching those Jews first that they might repent, that God might gather in that remnant before he brought this judgment. 
We're getting very close now to the end of Paul's course in reaching all of these Jews. Now last week we looked at Luke's account of the shipwreck as Paul was on his way to Rome to preach the gospel there. Remember that was God's plan to bring the gospel to Rome. Paul had uh, warned the centurion who was in charge of the boat not to proceed to Rome uh, because of the possibility of inclement weather at that time of the year. This was around late September, early October, a time when it was very unwise to uh, sail the seas because it was very dangerous. But they didn't listen to Paul. They listened instead to the captain of the ship and to the pilot, and they went on their way. The result was very bad weather, very bad situation. They reached the point where all hope was lost. They thought they were going to die. But then the Lord gave Paul a promise. He said that he would keep him and all the crew safe if they would do just one thing. Everyone needed to stay in the boat. Everyone needed to trust this promise of the Lord. And if they did, they would be saved at least temporarily from the storm. And the reason why, of course, the Lord gave that promise was to preserve Paul so he could go to Rome and preach the gospel there. Now, even though the sailors doubted that promise and they tried to abandon the ship, the soldiers believed, they stopped the sailors from trying to escape, and they were all brought safely to land. And you know, you, we really can't help but see here an analogy between this and the promise or the way that God works through the promises of the gospel as he brings people to faith in Christ. First, there is the warning of the gospel. You need to repent and believe or judgment is coming. Generally, when people hear about these things, they, they aren't converted all at once, but they resist. They don't want to believe. And yet, if the Lord is intending to bring them to himself, he doesn't leave them alone there. He doesn't stop there. The Lord brings about some kind of a humbling situation. He brings them in, into some sort of a trial or something that brings them very low, that brings them to the very end of their resources that, that oftentimes looks like a hopeless situation. You've heard those testimonies before where people said, you know, I got into drugs and I did all these things and I was about to commit suicide, but then I heard the gospel. And it's not that they didn't hear the gospel before. They probably did hear it before, but they didn't see their need of it before. But now they sense their need. They sense the hopelessness that apart from something greater than themselves, there is no hope for them. It's at times like that the Lord breaks through the storm by means of a promise and gives them the grace to trust in Christ through the new birth. We do need to remember that no one is ever going to come to Christ unless they see their need of Christ. Even as those, those soldiers would not have listened in other circumstances to any promise that God had to make, uh, had to make unless they were in a situation where they were, they were helpless and there was nothing they could do. God has to bring us to that state of helplessness to show us that there is no hope apart from His intervention, apart from His Messiah. Then people will listen. Then they will pay attention. And it's often at times like that when God is going to grant the new birth that He does. But we mustn't forget too that the Lord often works this way in our lives to humble us, to remind us of how much we must rely upon the Lord entirely for everything, for everything that we need Him for. We rarely seek the Lord as we ought to seek Him when things are going well, which is why the Lord often brings trials into our lives to drive us to Him. We find at times like that it's very easy to seek the Lord because we've come to the end of our resources. God wants us to remember that at all times and to trust in Him at all times. Now we do need to remember that this shipwreck was a part of God's plan. The Lord was the one who brought about the chain of events that he did to bring Paul to where he was. I think we have to assume that the Lord desired that this island, which was also a part of the Roman Empire, would hear the gospel before the end of the age should come. Our God is a missionary God. He wills that all men hear the gospel and that they repent. And so, of course, the gospel has to get out to them. God brings about those arrangements. This morning we see Paul's ministry at Malta. Now that God has stopped them there, what it is that actually takes place. The first thing we see is the kindness of the natives. Extraordinary kindness. Showing us something of God's common grace in the work, or at least in the lives of all men. God is at work at some level in the lives of everyone. 
But second, we, do, we see several miracles that the Lord performs through Paul to confirm his word to these natives because they need something more than just their extraordinary kindness to commend themselves to God. They need the gospel if they are to be saved. So first of all, we see the kindness of the natives, which shows us that God is at work, at least in some level, in all men. Now the first thing they discovered, at least what we read in our text, that they discovered when they had landed, was the name of the island, which is Malta. If you look on a map, Malta is a small island off the southern tip of Italy. In other words, they weren't very far from their destination. And through all this storm and turmoil, they had made a great deal of progress. They weren't that far away from Rome. Now this island, <clears throat> for those of you who have King James Version of the Bible, you'll find it in your Bibles. Melita is another name of the island. And uh, you know, the funny thing is when I'm preparing worship for the services, I'm always looking at the names of the tunes and I become familiar with the names of many tunes. And this is one, this, this Melita is the name of a tune I'm very familiar with and you're familiar with as well. A very uh, famous and popular hymn. It's called the Mariner's Hymn. We don't sing that hymn here. It's not in our hymnal. But the tune is. And we've sung it to, um, well, the Lord's Prayer for one song. Okay. Uh, this is also called the, the Navy Hymn because it's sung at that Naval Academy at Annapolis. And uh, the reason why it's called Melita, this is just as an aside, is because the author John Dykes, who wrote it, and he lived from 1823 to 1876, named it after this shipwreck in the book of Acts. So it's not just coincidence that the tune is called Melita and it has to do with the Mariner's Hymn, which is basically a prayer that God would keep us safe when we're at sea. You can see why the Navy would like to sing it, but it's calling out to God, which is, when you think about it, it's unusual that the Naval Academy would still use it. Calling out to God to keep us safe while we're on the open sea, that he would protect us. And again, you can see the correlation between this and uh, the shipwreck here at Melita. God kept them safe even though the ship was wrecked. All of them were saved. Well, the island of Malta was originally colonized by the Phoenicians. They were the first people, I think, that sailed in boats and they were very famous for their boats. And then the Greeks, when Alexander conquered the world, I think, uh, conquered it in uh, 736 BC. I'm not sure if those are the dates of Alexander, but it was conquered by the Greeks, then the Carthaginians in 528, and then the Romans in 242 BC. Currently, it was under Roman rule at the time of the shipwreck. But it was still inhabited by the descendants of these Phoenicians. The word that is used in the Greek to describe them is barbarians. These were barbarians. Now, barbarian does not mean that there's some sort of... Uh, you know, tribe that, that is interested in nothing more than just do, you know, wrecking havoc. That's, I think, what we think of as barbarians. Maybe you've seen some of those old movies, you know, uh, Samson and the Barbarians or whatever it may be. And the barbarians are always this uncultured, uh, uh, very aggressive group of people. But that's not really what the word means. The word means one who is considered to be outside the civilized world because they speak neither Greek nor Latin. In other words, they're not speaking the cultured language. They, they speak some other kind of barbaric language. And it sounds like, I think you've heard this expression, like they're just sort of mumbling, bar, 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 or whatever it may be. And that's where they got their name. Okay. Now, it doesn't, as I said, doesn't mean they're aggressive people. It just simply means that they are not a part of that Western culture. Verse 2 in our text could be translated in this way. The people there who spoke a strange language showed us extraordinary kindness. So they're not this barbarous group of people on the one hand, but on the other hand, don't think of them as your typical natives. You know, native has a certain connotation, doesn't it? You expect them to be wearing grass skirts or something and, you know, sort of Polynesian or something like that. That's not what's in mind either. Uh, these were Phoenicians and uh, they were a part of the people group that lived in, in, that, uh, in the Near East, but they've simply migrated to this island. Okay, but the, the main point is they didn't speak Greek, they didn't speak Latin. Now the second thing that they discovered was that the inhabitants of this island were extraordinarily kind. These barbarians, you know, these, uh, these natives of the island saw what had happened. Okay, they saw the ship that was wrecked on the reef. They saw these men who had jumped overboard and had made it to the shore to save themselves 
they saw with the rain coming and the cold setting in because of the time of year that it was and you know we're talking about fall and um, if you've ever been to the coast during a coastal storm in the fall you realize it can get kind of chilly and wet they saw these men were wet they saw they were cold and what Luke singles out here is the fact that they took note of these things they took note of the men they took note of their needs and they did something about them. As a matter of fact, they went out of their way to help them. They kindled a fire to keep them warm. And they received them, taking care of their needs. Now, I think we need to see something here of God's common grace, don't we? Because there have been situations where, was it, um, is it John Elliott? Was that his name, the missionary? I know his last name was Jim Elliott. Right, Jim Elliott. <coughs> who tried to reach uh, a group of uh, natives, you know, is it the, uh, I forget now the name of the group, was it the Aukins or something like that? And as he tried to make contact with them, they struck him down dead, you see. And that just as easily could have happened uh, in this situation if it had not been for God's grace, God's common grace. Now we know that these natives had nothing of God's saving grace because they had never heard the gospel and they were unconverted. In this condition, they could have been very hostile, as we know that there are many situations where they are. But these natives were not. They showed kindness. They showed extraordinary kindness. They showed a, a, a kind of hospitality that many Christians don't show in showing uh, mercy to these who were in need. Now, why were they doing this? Were they, was, was Paul to assume, I mean, did Paul look at their kindness and say, wow, you know, these, these guys are so good, they don't need to hear my gospel. They're already good enough. You know, is it that these men already had saving grace in their souls, a spark of goodness left? Uh, no. Actually, they had nothing of God's Spirit, nothing of His saving work. And again, if we don't understand the kind of work that the Spirit of God does in the hearts of all men, then we're not going to be able to make sense out of this. There was a, a story that um, Bob Strimple, who's a professor of systematic theology at uh, Westminster Seminary, at least he was when I was there, uh, gave to try to illustrate this. He, he talked about a certain student that was in class, I think at the same time that he was. And he decided that he wanted to be a missionary. So he trained uh, you know, theologically and then he, he uh, went out to get the support that he needed to become a missionary and he started traveling and he didn't have a great deal of support but he started taking different train rides and bus rides and so forth trying to get to the mission field now interestingly along the way he met several people that were from different nations or even from from you know the United States that had different backgrounds and believed different religions and he found out something about these people that he wasn't ready to to reckon with and that was they were nice they were nice people. They were kind. They did kind things for him. Uh, they weren't those um, those sort of long toothed you know, red-eyed kind of characters that, they ex that he expected to find by looking in the Bible and seeing what unbelievers were like. Having nothing of the grace of God in them, being enemies of God, haters of God, and persecutors of the church, he found that that wasn't always the case. And as a matter of fact, by the time he got to the point where he could go out to do mission work, he had lost his whole purpose. He said, these guys are good enough. Why do they need to hear the gospel? Well, there was something that obviously he didn't understand about his theological background. Maybe that he didn't take enough classes. Maybe he didn't take the doctrine of man class or maybe the doctrine of the Holy Spirit to understand the work that God does by his spirit in the lives of unconverted people. The spirit does restrain sin. The spirit does work through the conscience. He does bring conviction. And this influence can be very, very strong to the point where unbelievers can even outstrip Christians in their, their giving, in their acts of kindness and hospitality, even as we see here. The Spirit of God can compel men to do things that are very beneficial to other people. So Sometimes that work can be so strong, we might even wonder why it is this person needs to hear the gospel. But we do need to bear in mind that just because a person feels compassion for someone else and goes out of their way to take care of their needs, that doesn't mean that they're converted. It also doesn't mean that they don't need to be converted. No one is good enough to enter into heaven apart from Christ. 
No one is perfect. And that's what God requires is perfection. You know, we read the uh, story of the Good Samaritan so many times and we think about the good things that the Good Samaritan did and how Jesus pointed to him as an example of what a good neighbor is. But you know what? He was a Samaritan. He wasn't even a part of, of God's covenant people. He was a stranger to the gospel. It may be that Jesus wasn't even contemplating the Good Samaritan as a converted person. He was just simply pointing to him as an example of what we ought to do as believers for one another. Okay, no one is good enough to enter into heaven by their good works. The common work of the Holy Spirit is not enough to save a person. They have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord provides the influence that he does in the hearts of men universally to preserve the world so that he can bring the elect into the world and gather them out of the world so the world doesn't destroy itself. If God were to pull back his restraint, we would see that these people what they're really like. You know, what we might expect to see when we read the scriptures about the condition of their hearts. How much they hate God. How much they hate those that are made in His image. How much like the devil they really are. It's only God's common work that restrains it. But it doesn't mean that they don't need to be evangelized. If they do not know about Jesus Christ, if they have not heard the gospel, if they haven't repented and believed, they are not good enough to enter into heaven. They need to trust in Jesus. So from this example, first of all, let's be reminded of two things. God would have us to be hospitable as these men and to show extraordinary kindness, to show compassion to those who are in need. But second, we need to remember that even if we should show extraordinary kindness or others show extraordinary kindness, that doesn't mean that we're saved. We're only saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and if we do the things that we do out of a love for God. Those natives were not doing it out of a love for God as we'll see in just a moment. But they, they were doing those things, truly, but they were not doing them for the right reasons and they were not doing them to give glory to God. They did not have enough. So remember that people who are kind and good, the pleasing pagans, the people that we see that might even outstrip us in their giving and their good works, they need the Lord Jesus Christ. They cannot be saved by those works. Now this brings us to the second point, and that is the miracles that were performed here, the mercies that the Lord gave in bringing the gospel to them and confirming this gospel through these miracles because of their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember the Lord had a purpose in bringing Paul to the island and that purpose was to preach the gospel. And that's the reason why we see the series of miracles. God does not do miracles in a vacuum. And even though there's nothing here explicitly about Paul preaching the gospel, you know Paul well enough by now that if he sees an opportunity, he's going to speak. And even if it's not recorded, that doesn't mean he didn't say anything. Luke did not give us an exhaustive you know, uh, account of everything that happened. And even uh, the messages that were preached were pared down. They were not word for word everything that was said. If they were, they were awfully short messages. Okay? I don't believe we are to assume that. Uh, the Lord brought Paul and he spoke on many occasions as we saw last week. I'm sure he preached the gospel to those sailors in the boat. doesn't say he did, but he was on that ship for months. What's Paul going to do with all that time? He's going to preach the gospel. That's the reason why God sent him out in the first place. So that's what these miracles are now bearing witness to is the word of the gospel. The first miracle we see is Paul's deliverance from a poisonous snake bite. Paul apparently was recovered, he wasn't injured from this shipwreck, well enough to gather up sticks and to lay them on the fire. But as he was laying them on the fire, the particular bundle of sticks that he had, had a passenger on board, something he didn't expect to see, and that is a poisonous snake. The word in the Greek means viper, means asp, it refers to a very poisonous kind of snake. And when he put the, the, the sticks on the fire, the fire drove the snake out of the sticks, and the first thing it did was to fasten its grip on Paul's hand, which means it, it bit him and released its venom into his body. Now the natives didn't say when they saw this, wow, you know, we better pray for this man because he needs to be saved, or we need to pray to God that God would deliver him from this bite. Instead, they saw this as an act of 
perhaps a pagan god, they had sort of personified justice. This man must be a murderer. And even though that storm at sea was probably meant to kill him, he escaped from it, but justice is still going to have her due. He's going to die from the snake bite. Okay, they thought Paul must be some kind of murderer. Okay? And I think this shows, I think, well, I, I believe it shows something of the universal idea of morality that God places in all men. That's one of the arguments for the existence of God is that everyone has a conscience and everyone knows something about God's justice and even though they attributed this perhaps to a some kind of a deity or a personified deity they made, they made justice a God they still understood that a man who takes another person's life deserves to die even though they were completely mistaken about Paul. Okay, So we see something of that universal morality Murderers deserve to die. But when Paul calmly shook the viper into the fire and didn't suffer any ill effects from the bite for some time afterwards, they changed their minds. They thought instead of a murderer, he must be a god. And this isn't the first time that a miracle produced this kind of effect. Remember when Paul and Barnabas were preaching to the people at Lystra and they healed the layman. the first thing they did was they brought out sacrifices to sacrifice to them because they thought Zeus had come down and Hermes was there as well as the chief spokesman. Okay, so they mistook them. This shows their superstition and their ignorant nature and a further reason they needed to hear the gospel. They showed extraordinary kindness, but they were not converted. The only way to overcome this kind of ignorance and superstition is by communicating the gospel. Paul had to tell them to repent even as they told those men at Lystra. Don't sacrifice to us. We're just men like you. We're, we've actually come to tell you to repent of that kind of behavior and trust in the true God. Now, this is the only way to overcome ignorance, the only way to overcome superstition. We have to get the gospel out to as many as we can. Now, this was the first miracle and it certainly gained their attention. Now the second miracle was the healing of the Roman official's father. The Roman governor of the land, whose name was Publius, also showed Paul and the ship's company extraordinary kindness, extraordinary hospitality by welcoming them into his house and entertaining them for three days. While they were there, Paul found out that his father had been sick for days with fever and dysentery. Dysentery seems to be a very serious disease where blood is basically coming out and from different places where it ought not to be coming out, something that was very life-threatening, and the man would have died. But Paul went in to see him, prayed for him, laid his hands on him, and healed him. And then finally we see when the natives hear about uh, what Paul had done, that all who were sick came to Paul, and they were cured. Paul kept laying his hands on them. Paul, by God's grace, was healing them. Now again, understanding the reason why the Lord gave miracles, which was to confirm his word, and that Paul would never have allowed any opportunity uh, to communicate the gospel to pass by, we have to assume that Paul was preaching the gospel and that Christ was bearing witness to that gospel through signs and wonders. You know, it's, it's been said that um, we see signs and wonders sort of trailing off towards the end of the book of Acts, but the reason why we see that is because there wasn't any new ground being broken. But here, new ground is being broken. And we see this resurgence of the signs and wonders that the Lord was giving to confirm His Word. God always seemed to work more miracles you know, when new ground was being broken, when, when new people groups were being reached to confirm His Word to them, than especially when... He had already brought the gospel to them. They had already rejected it. There, the Lord Jesus himself could do few miracles because of the lack of faith. So these miracles were meant to confirm the word. The gospel was being presented to these natives at Malta. And we need to assume the Lord was gathering out of them those that he was saving. We see that their response was very positive. They honored Paul and his company with many marks of respect and supplied everything that they need for their continuing voyage. Now, what are we to learn from the things we've seen in these ten verses? Well, let me just remind you of three. First of all, the gospel is God's word, and the only message that God has given by which 
we can be saved. Apart from the gospel message, ordinarily there is no salvation. We know that there are some exceptions. God is able to save infants dying in infancy if they are his elect. He is able to save those that never grow to the point mentally, intellectually, to understand the gospel. He's able to save his elect from them as well. But in every other case, the Bible tells us they must hear the gospel if they are to be saved. We cannot assume that people are going to be saved apart from it. Okay? That is the only message of salvation. Christ is the only way to heaven. There are not many roads that lead to God. There are not many religions. There is only one true religion. There is only one true gospel. The world hates to hear that. The world will not accept that. But that is the truth. So unless we embrace that gospel, we will not be saved. Unless we bring that gospel to others, they will not be saved. Secondly, we need to remember that common grace isn't enough. No matter how nice that individual is that you know, no matter how nice your neighbors are, no matter how sympathetic, compassionate, and giving they are, if they have not trusted in Jesus Christ, they will not be saved. They will be lost. Because no matter how nice a person is, they are not perfect. And perfection is what is required to get into heaven. If you understood the heart of your neighbor who seems to be so nice, you would see how imperfect they are. If you understood your own heart and understood your own perfections, you would see there is no way that you can be good enough to enter into heaven. The gospel is the only way. Common grace isn't enough. You must trust in Christ, and you can only do that, of course, by God's saving grace. And then finally, we're reminded again that God is a missionary God. He wants his gospel preached to every nation, to every tongue, to every people group on earth. The gospel was sent first to the Jews because it was their gospel. The Messiah was promised to them. They were the ones who were to have the first offer. But when they rejected Christ, he turned to the Gentiles and evangelized the whole Roman Empire. But also every people group. These barbarians, remember, were outside of the category of, of the Greeks. They didn't speak Greek. They didn't speak Latin. They were, I guess for all intents and purposes, you might even consider them a third world group almost. You know, they were barbarians. But God breached that language barrier with the gospel as well and brought the gospel to them because God is a missionary God. That's the reason why he stopped them at the island of Malta. The Lord wants everyone to hear. And since the work is not yet done, since the Great Commission is not yet fulfilled, we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to give. We need to continue to work and to witness that the gospel may advance and that the Lord might gather all of his people into his kingdom. May the Lord help us to again look at this example, to be encouraged by it, to learn from it and to do what we can, what we are able to do to get the gospel out to others. Let's uh, spend a few moments now in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us take these things to heart.